On Thursday, February 20th, 2003, the band Great White attempted to perform a concert in the small rural town of West Warwick, Rhode Island. That night ultimately tore apart the lives of 462 young music fans and changed the perception of the band forever. In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at the tragedy of the Station Nightclub fire. This is a story of how a few careless decisions, a poorly designed nightclub, and ego marked one of the music industry's greatest tragedies. But before we get started, subscribe to our channel Weird History, leave a comment, and let us know what you think about the video. Somewhere around 1989, Great White was at the height of their popularity. Their fourth studio album, Twice Shy, had just gone double platinum, and they went from opening for second-tier metal acts like Rat and Night Ranger to headlining their own arena tour in a matter of months. Thirteen years later, the ride was over, and Great White had broken up. In an attempt at salvaging his career, Great White lead singer Jack Russell decided to go solo, but after a year of disappointment, he contacted his former bandmate, guitarist Mark Kendall. Russell's plan was to perform a string of small club dates with the members of his solo backing band along with Kendall, and bill the act as Jack Russell's Great White to boost the element of nostalgia. So while the marquee in the front of the station announced Great White as the evening's headliner, the people in attendance that night were technically going to see Jack Russell, Mark Kendall, and three unknown musicians playing old Great White songs. Ten years later, Kendall would tell a Rolling Stone reporter, It was basically just me and Russell and his solo band. I didn't even know these people. I just met them. Not long after a quick sound check, Russell was seen walking around West Warwick, handing out free surplus tickets to that night's gig to anyone that recognized him. Several hours later, sometime after 10 p.m., the band took the stage and launched into Desert Moon, a top 40 single for the original Great White in 1991. During the song's guitar intro, before Russell even reached his microphone, the band's road manager, Daniel Beakley, set off a cluster of gerbs, cylindrical tubes that produce a controlled fountain of sparks. These three gerbs set the spray 15 feet in the air for 15 seconds, were positioned at the foot of the drummer's riser. Two tubes sprayed sparks at 45 degree angles on either side of the stage, while the third tube shot sparks directly into the air behind Russell. It would be the gerbs that shot the angled sparks that would ultimately set the station on fire. Although the band said the station's owners okayed the use of pyrotechnics, the small club was nowhere close to meeting proper fire codes. Besides not having a sprinkler system, the stage walls were coated with two layers of an acoustic foam. An outer urethane layer of foam sprayed over a base of polyethylene foam. When ignited, both foams worked in tandem, giving the audience closest to the flashpoint very little chance of survival. Before Russell even got to the opening lyrics of Desert Moon, the fountain of sparks ignited the highly flammable outer layer of urethane foam on the club's walls almost immediately, much faster than if the wall was made out of drywall or plaster. Once the inner polyethylene layer ignited, it produced a thick black cloud of smoke which released carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide gas. While the flames caused structural damage, it was the toxic smoke from the base layer of polyethylene that would be most deadly to the audience members closest to the stage. Inhaling the smoke only a few times would cause Cause rapid loss of consciousness and eventually death by internal suffocation. As Russell got through the first couple of lines of his lyrics, the pyrotechnics that Beckley ignited finished spraying, but by that time, small flames on the stage were visible and they were quickly spreading. Smoke from the inner layer of polyethylene foam was also already hovering over the audience closest to the stage. Most fans thought the smoke and fire were part of the show, although some people in the pit were seen hurriedly walking towards the exit. The fans that remained could be seen pumping their fists and raising their bottles of beer at Russell as the band played on. It wasn't until Russell's third verse that the audience realized that the smoke and fire weren't planned. The band stopped playing. Russell looked over his shoulder, attempted to put out the fire with a cup of water, and addressed the situation to no one in particular over the PA. Wow, this ain't good. Within seconds, a high-pitched fire alarm pierced through the venue, and the audience of 462 started to show signs of panic. The club only had a capacity of 404. People tried to leave through the main door opposite of the stage. Some audience members tried to escape through the backstage exit. Rob Feeney, an audience member who went to the concert with his fiancée, recalls that moment. I expected the fire to go out either by the sprinklers or a fire extinguisher, so we started to head towards the exit, and I saw the band jumping off, and then one of the bouncers grabbed my fiancé by the shoulders and held her back into me, and told her that the backstage exit was for the band only, and that we had to wait to get out the front door. 
Feeney said he and his fiance took six steps in the direction of the main exit before both were knocked to the ground by a figure fully engulfed by flames. When Feeney realized what had happened, he tried to pull his fiance to safety by her feet, but within seconds, her body was lifeless. She was already dead. In the pitch black smoke, Feeney crawled his way to a wall where he found an opening and escaped. After 55 seconds on stage, the band exited the venue. Thinking the fire wasn't all bad, Kendall effortlessly walked out of the building through the backstage door and actually made a phone call to his wife, telling her the concert might run a little late after a stage fire was extinguished. When I walked out the door, it just seemed like an easy thing to do. I just walked out. I just saw the door open. The band's second guitarist, Ty Longley, thought the fire was minor too. Although he had already exited the club with the rest of the band, he ran back into the venue to grab his guitar. The show's MC, WHJY DJ Mike the Doctor Gonzalez, thought the same thing and tried to retrieve some of his audio equipment. Both were found dead after inhaling the dense, toxic smoke from the inner layer of polyethylene foam. With two of the station's four exits chained shut, and the backstage exit barricaded by one of the club's bouncers, the majority of the audience bottlenecked their way towards the building's main entrance. As the fire raged inside, bodies began piling on top of each other. Survivors said that they could hear people screaming, bottles exploding, lights shattering, and wood beams cracking. Some people were trampled while others ran, looking for an escape with their heads on fire. All of a sudden, a flashover blazed through the room, and as Feeney said, there were no more screams, no more alarms, just a crackling of wood. After they put out the fire and investigated the scene, firefighters found a hundred bodies in various areas of the venue. The bathrooms, the kitchen, the back offices, and maybe the most heartbreaking, 40 bodies stacked on top of each other in the hallway leading out the front door, some within a couple feet from the exit. Of the 462 fans who attended the concert, a hundred people died. Of the 362 people who survived, 230 were seriously injured, either from burns, smoke inhalation, thermal trauma, or trampling. Days after the fire, investigators dug deep into figuring out who would ultimately take the blame for the disaster. Jack Russell, the club owners, Daniel Beakley, the road manager, the concert promoters, and the manufacturers and distributors of the foam material and the pyrotechnics were all under the microscope. Ultimately, the band's road manager, Daniel Beakley, and the club owners, Michael and Jeffrey Dadarian, were each charged with 200 counts of involuntary manslaughter. Two counts per death since they were indicted under two separate theories of the crime, criminal negligence manslaughter and misdemeanor manslaughter. Against his lawyer's advice, Beakley immediately pleaded guilty because he said, I wanted to bring peace. I wanted this to be over with. Beakley was sentenced to 15 years in prison, with four to serve plus three years probation. He served a little less than two years. Michael Dadarian received 15 years in prison with four to serve plus three years probation. He served 27 months. Jeffrey Dadarian got off light with a 10 year suspended sentence, three years probation and 500 hours of community service. Jack Russell didn't receive any punishment. Since then, he's never even formally apologized or made any sort of meaningful acknowledgement of the event either. Russell's lawyer said that he wasn't charged because his actions weren't criminal. He didn't like the pyro, he had no financial connection to the club, and he had nothing to do with the installment of the acoustic foam. Russell also maintains the band got permission from the club owners to use the pyro, although the Dadarians denied the claim. The WPRI-TV, a Providence, Rhode Island television station, made an out-of-court settlement of $30 million due to the claim that their cameraman named Brian Butler, who happened to be filming in a club that night, was said to be obstructing the escape and not sufficiently helping people exit. Five months after the fire, Great White went out on a benefit tour for the victims and family members affected by the station tragedy, giving a portion of the proceeds to the Station Fire Memorial Foundation. Gina Russo, a survivor of the fire with disfiguring scars and the president of the foundation, said her group rejected all proceeds from Russell's benefit tour because she said it seemed like a publicity ploy. As she told the Boston Globe in February 2017, it's just not appropriate. It's the whole Great White name, and in our world, it's tarnished. During this fundraising tour, Russell would lead a prayer at the beginning of each show for the families, friends, and victims affected by the fire. He and the band also vowed to never play the song Desert Moon again. As Russell told the Providence Journal in 2003, I don't think I could ever sing that song again. Kendall agreed and told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in 2005, we haven't played that song. Things that bring back memories of that night we try to stay away from. And that song reminds us of that night. 
We still haven't played it since then, and we probably never will. By 2009, the band had resumed performing the song. As Russell explained later, it wasn't the song's fault. Nowadays, there are two factions of Great White. Great White, led by Mark Kendall, the lead guitarist and co-founder of the band, and Jack Russell's Great White, still fronted by Russell. While Great White can still draw a decent crowd of a thousand or two a night, mostly at casinos, resorts, and county fairs, Russell's version of Great White has had a difficult time sustaining a fan base. Russell's brand usually resorts to playing bars and dinner theaters along with the odd 80s reunion lineups co-headlining with other bands of that era, but it's not for the lack of trying. Russell is a hustler and he performs several times a month, sometimes with his version of Great White and other times with offshoots of the bands like Jack Russell's Great White Acoustic Duo or Jack Russell and the Shelter Dogs. But the reason why Russell will never attain the level of reverence or size of audiences Kendall's versions of Great White gets is because he never took much ownership of the station's tragedy. Gina Russo summed up Russell's detractors very simply. He has never apologized for his role in this disaster. Everyone would look at this differently if Jack Russell would just stand up and say, I'm sorry. Russell knows this, but he still refuses to address fans. So what do you think about the aftermath of the Station Nightclub fire? Who do you believe? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other music stories and our weird history.